Try to imagine the following scenario. It is the dead of night and the temperature is far below freezing. Your home and most of your possessions have just gone up in flames. Along with five members of your family, you were able to escape the fire, only to find that five other family members, all children, are unaccounted for. It soon becomes all too obvious that they have perished in the fire. This is, at best, a shock and difficult to accept. Then things turn from saddening to surreal when you are told that no trace of your children can be found among the ashes. Not only have they been deprived of their lives, but also any hope of burial or closure. There will be no caskets, no real funeral, and no last goodbyes. To thine own self be true and ponder for a moment just how you would react. Acceptance, bewilderment, depression, denial. Just how would you react if you were a member of the Sauter family? Questions aside, one fact trumps all others. As far as law enforcement and the state of West Virginia are concerned, there is no mystery here. Officially, the five Sauter children, ranging in age from 6 to 15, all perished in the early morning hours of December 25, 1945. Initially, parents George and Jenny Sauter acquiesced and did their best to move on with their lives. However, as the years passed, they collectively began to wonder if all was as it seemed. They had never blindly accepted the fact that the fire had been accidental, and their growing skepticism eventually led them to ask a far more difficult question. Was it possible that their five children could still be alive? This one question would soon lead them down a long and winding road of hope, despair, accusations, rebuttals, and denials. A road which would long outlive them both. A road which many still contend has not yet reached its terminus. The story of the Sauter family and the Christmas fire of 1945 is certainly not unknown. Over the years, the tale has spread far beyond the city of Fayetteville and the state of West Virginia. Today, an online search of the family name will return a plethora of results, ranging from scholarly examinations to wild, conspiracy-laden guesswork. Here on YouTube alone, the same search will return an equally extensive list of results, some based on logic and thorough research, others based on mangled and regurgitated theories. Such is the nature of a topic that has now spanned over seven decades and, for better or worse, been pigeonholed with other quasi-legends like the Lindbergh kidnapping and the butcher of Kingsbury Run. Under normal circumstances, Mysterious WV would not produce a profile for a case which has officially been resolved and closed. And yet, there is just no denying the fact that the case of the Sauter family and the fate of their five young children is one that simply refuses to go gently into the proverbial sweet good night. For years, Mysterious W.V. has deliberately refrained from directly addressing the Sauter case, maintaining a policy of profiling only cases which can be genuinely classified as either unsolved or, at the least, undetermined. 
And while this feature is being presented as a case study and not part of the regular series, it can no longer be classified as officially excluded from the official realm of the unknown. To wit, this, the cover page of the report of investigation prepared by the West Virginia Department of Public Safety, literally the first official documentation of the incident, begins its discussion of the fire's cause and origin with one word, undetermined. This is not a rehashed, second-hand, half-baked theory from an uninformed source, but the genuine, original, 77-year-old typewritten record of the fire that consumed the Sauter's home, prepared by and for the state of West Virginia as its official conclusion. Or, put more simply, a single-worded admission that no one officially could say with certainty how the fire did or did not start. In short, a mystery, and therefore a case well deserving of another look. Over the last seven decades, the story of the Sauter family has been told and retold ad infinitum in newspapers, magazines, and across the entirety of the World Wide Web. However, like a well-intentioned game of telephone, the nuts and bolts that hold the original narrative together are loosened and occasionally lost each time it is passed along. In this feature, we will, whenever possible, draw upon public accounts contemporary to the events being discussed, or the original surviving documentation from the various investigating agencies, graciously made available to Mysterious W.V. by a descendant of the Sauter family. George Sauter was born Giorgio Sadu in Tula on the Italian island of Sardinia on November 25, 1895, one of several children born to Giorgio and Maria Sadu. He immigrated to America in April of 1911, for a time, he found work on the railroads of Pennsylvania, and some time later, he headed south, eventually making his way to the small town of Smithers, West Virginia. On November 4, 1922, he married Jenny Cipriani, who had herself immigrated to America from Italy in 1904. According to his declaration of intent in 1923, he and Jenny were living in Scarborough, West Virginia, where George was working as a taxi driver. By 1930, George and Jenny had four children and had moved to nearby Fallsview. George was listed as being a truck driver for railroad construction. Fayette County records indicate that on October 12, 1935, Jenny Sauter purchased seven and a half acres of land between Fayetteville and Beckwith. The land was situated directly adjacent to what was then U.S. Route 19-21, listed in the deed book as the Giles Fayette Kanawha Turnpike. The land was purchased from Mr. and Mrs. Garfield Davis. Sometime before 1940, George Sauter went into business for himself, founding the Dempsey Transfer Company an organization which specialized in hauling coal and other materials in and around the Fayette County area. George ran the business out of the family home, located here, approximately two miles north of Fayetteville. George took care of the trucks, and Jenny kept the books. By 1945, the Sauters reportedly had six heavy trucks in their personal fleet, and ten children bearing the family name. The Sauter's eldest sons, John and Joseph, saw service during the Second World War. Christmas of 1945 was slated to be the first time the entire family would be together since the end of the long conflict. John arrived back in Fayetteville the week before Christmas. Joe, however, became hung up at an army base in North Carolina and consequently was not able to return to West Virginia in time. Joe's absence reportedly cast something of a cloud over the Sauter's Christmas Eve. 
The exact events of December 24th and 25th, 1945, have been the subject of passionate and sometimes even bitter debate. As such, it is impossible to present each variation in one direct narrative. First, we will illustrate a general overview of the events encompassing most of the points on which there has been little or no contention. Later, we will return to December 24th and 25th, and in a form of compare and contrast, we will present much more detailed accounts concerning many of the events which have been disputed or contested. According to published accounts, December 24th, 1945 unfolded like any other day in the lives of the Sauders. George, John, and George Jr. made several deliveries around the region using the trucks which were kept and maintained on the Sauders' property. Eldest daughter Marion went to work at Wall's Dime Store in Fayetteville. By the time the sun had set, the entire family, minus son Joe, were back at home, Marion having been the last to return at approximately 9.30 p.m. Perhaps hoping to raise some sagging holiday spirits, Marion presented the younger Sauter children with some toys she had purchased from her place of employment. At approximately 10 p.m., George and Jenny went to their ground-level bedroom, taking youngest daughter Sylvia with them. The other children happily protested that they wanted to stay up later, play with their new toys, and listen to the radio. George and Jenny relented, but reminded sons Maurice and Louis to finish their outside chores before going to bed. Fatigued from the day's work, John and George Jr. retired to their upstairs bedroom sometime between 11.15 and 11.30 p.m. Years later, they reported that they did not recall if the other children were still awake when they retired. Just what transpired over the next hour cannot be reconstructed with certainty. At some point, daughter Marion had fallen asleep on the living room couch while reading a magazine. Normally, Marion would have been responsible for ensuring that the young girls, Martha Lee, Jenny, and Betty, were taken up to bed. On this evening, she apparently dozed off before carrying out this routine task. At approximately 12.30 a.m., now December 25th, the telephone rang. Roused from her sleep, Jenny Sauter got out of bed and crossed over into the ground floor room utilized as an office. She answered the phone but did not recognize the female voice on the other end of the line. Jenny could hear laughing and revelry in the background and the caller asked for a man whom she did not know. Feeling the woman was either drunk or playing a joke, Jenny hung up the phone. Before going back to bed, she performed a quick spot check of the ground floor. Marion was still asleep on the sofa, and the other children were nowhere to be seen. Thinking all was well, Jenny Sauter went back to bed. The time, again, was approximately 12.30 a.m. Roughly 30 minutes later, Jenny was awakened again, this time by what sounded to her like a rock landing on the home's tin roof. Chalking the noise up to the high winds, Jenny again dozed off. At approximately 1.30 a.m., Jenny Sauter was roused again, but this time the reason was far more ominous. The bedroom was filling with smoke. Jenny jumped out of bed and ran across the hall to the office. A wall of flames was slowly engulfing the desk and the wall in the rear corner, effectively cutting off access to the telephone. Now very much awake, Jenny roused husband George and frantically yelled up the stairs to the other children. The fire was reportedly spreading fast. George and Jenny ran past the fire and onto the back porch by way of the kitchen. At approximately the same time, daughter Marion woke up and instinctively ran to her parents' bedroom to rescue the youngest child, Sylvia. With Sylvia in her arms, Marion ran into the living room and out the front door. 
The actions of John and George Jr. are more difficult to describe with certainty. They were both apparently roused by their mother's calls and made some attempt to get the attention of the other five children. They were then able to make their way down the stairs and out of the house. George broke the window leading to the stairway but was unable to climb through. He badly cut his hand in the process. With the stairs cut off, George next looked for a ladder that was normally kept in the area, but it was nowhere to be found. Frantic to find some way to get to the second floor, both George and son John ran to one of the trucks kept on the property, thinking they could back it up to the house and give the children another means of escape. However, in his frantic state, George Sauter apparently choked the truck too much and was unable to get it started. Unable to get to the Sauter's phone, Marion ran a short distance away to the home of Mr. and Mrs. Garfield Davis. Mrs. Davis tried to call the Fayetteville Volunteer Fire Department. There was no direct dial in 1945, and Mrs. Davis was unable to get through to an operator. Meanwhile, a passing motorist, Mr. Thomas Smith, was driving north towards his home in Beckwith when he spotted the fire. Smith made a U-turn and first drove to a nearby tavern called Grasses Park, but was told by the owners that their phone was out of order. Smith then quickly drove back into Fayetteville, where he was able to reach Fire Chief Forrest J. Morris by phone. Thomas Smith was left with the impression that nothing would be done anytime soon. Smith drove back to the Sauter's home, but found it engulfed in flames and mostly collapsed. Several other passers-by also spotted the flames and gathered at the scene. The fire burned through the night and was reportedly still glowing with embers when the fire department arrived at 8 a.m. Fire Chief Morris directed volunteer firemen James Rolls and Arnold Dempsey to soak the embers along with the rest of the debris. The Sauters and their surviving children retreated to a small two-room shack located elsewhere on the property. While the fire department was at work, troopers R.S. Rule and F.E. Springer with the Department of Public Safety, now the West Virginia State Police, arrived at approximately 9.15 a.m. Rules and Springer were the first investigators to speak directly with Mr. and Mrs. Sauter, as well as their son John, after the fire. Their interview notes, included in the final report issued on January 22, 1946, would become the basic foundation upon which most future accounts of the fire are based. By around 10 a.m., the debris had cooled to the point that the area could be searched. George Jr. and John joined in the search, but the others remained behind in the shack. Eventually, Fire Chief Morris had George and Jenny Sauter brought back to the scene and advised them that no trace of the other five children could be found. Morris later recalled that the Sauters were distraught almost to the point of incoherence. He gently suggested to Mr. Sauter that he gather five separate piles of ashes from the debris and use them for a burial service. George Sauter is said to have then stated that he would prefer to simply remove the debris and fill the entire basement with dirt. Fire Chief Morris acquiesced. However, members of the State Fire Marshal's office, who arrived shortly after noon, later advised that Mr. Sauter was instructed not to disturb the scene in any way until they could inspect things for themselves. Over the next few days, the fire-damaged items were removed from the scene, though to what extent the debris was searched after December 25th is not known with certainty. What is certain is that on Saturday, December 29th, Jenny Sauter's brother, Jimmy Cipriani, used a bulldozer to fill in the former basement with dirt. An inquest convened in Fayetteville on December 26th concluded that the five Sauter children had perished in the fire, either as a result of heat or suffocation. On Sunday, December 29th, Reverend W.F. Fogelsong and James Frame 
presided over a memorial service for the five children held on the very site where the Sauter's home had stood. Hundreds of residents, family members, and friends turned out, necessitating the employment of law enforcement to manage traffic. While a choir sang, Lead Kindly Light, Reverend Frame encouraged those present to look up and beyond the trials and troubles of the present and to a future which can be made brighter by love and sacrifice and better living. Reverend James Frame. While their five surviving children were present, George and Jenny Sauter were too emotionally overwrought to attend. Feeling that the matter had been handled well enough by the Department of Public Safety, the State Fire Marshal's Office opted to not investigate the matter further. The report of the Department of Public Safety concurred with the inquest and determined that the five children had perished in the home. However, they were unable to conclusively determine the exact cause of the fire. As stated earlier, it was officially listed as undetermined. And under normal circumstances, that would have been that. An apparent tragic accident leading to tragic loss of life. For nearly two years, George and Jenny Sauter seemed resigned to the fact that five of their children were dead and that all that remained was to carry on with life. However, all of that began to change in 1947 when two odd occurrences rekindled their simmering doubts. Contrary to some accounts, the doubts of George and Jenny Sauter concerning the fire are not a later product of grief and prodding. A statement made by John Sauter to the Beckley Post-Herald the very day after the fire leaves little doubt as to his opinion. He stated simply, quote, I think somebody set the fire, end quote. The article goes on to state that Jenny Sauter and the rest of the family were of the same opinion. Then, in early 1947, an essay published in Look magazine caught the Sauter's eyes. One of the photos depicted several children in a New York school. Mr. and Mrs. Sauter felt that one of them looked too much like one of their deceased children to be a coincidence. George and Jenny made a trip to New York, but were not allowed access to any of the children. While this lead went nowhere, additional seeds of doubt would soon be sown in the Sauter's minds. James Frame, one of those who had presided at the Sauter's memorial service, heard a disturbing rumor. Fire Chief Morris had apparently stated that on the day of the fire, he had found what he thought was a human heart in the debris and later buried it in the Sauter's basement. Knowing that the human heart is extremely difficult to burn, Frame contacted Morris, who confirmed the story. Reverend Frame reported the information to the Sauters, who were naturally quite upset. It took quite a bit of prodding, but Fire Chief Morris eventually went out to the Sauter's home and pointed out where he had placed the box. When asked why he had not told them about this before they had filled the basement with dirt, Morris replied that he thought he had. Indeed, there is documented evidence that Chief Morris's actions were either witnessed by a third party or he had told someone about it in 1945. We will examine this evidence in detail later on. With Chief Morris present, along with private detective Oscar Tinsley, an employee of Mr. Sauter, dug up a wooden box in the area indicated by Morris. The box was found under a piece of tire roofing at the very bottom of the basement. Morris positively identified the box as the one he had buried in 1945. Sauter and Tinsley wrapped the box in a piece of tarpaulin and, for reasons that are unclear, took it not to the local police department, but rather to Harold Gay, owner of Gay Funeral Home in Montgomery. In a signed affidavit dated November 2, 1949, Harold Gay recalled the events of that day. 
I, Harold Gay, do hereby certify that on or about the middle of 1947, one O.C. Tinsley and one George Sauter brought to this establishment a box. On opening this box and examining its contents, I saw a liver wrapped in newspapers. This said liver, I do firmly believe, was beef liver. Detective Tinsley wanted to send a portion of the substance to a professional in Baltimore to obtain a positive identification. Tinsley asked Gay to preserve the substance until he could make arrangements. Gay preserved the alleged organ with embalming fluid, replaced it in the original box, and then placed the box on the back porch owing to its foul odor. Ten days later, Tinsley called and said that he was coming to pick up the box. Gay moved the box to the steps of the back porch. Tinsley arrived the following day only to find that the box had vanished. It is theorized that the box may have been picked up by the Montgomery Sanitation Department and taken along with the rest of the rubbish to the city incinerator. Contrary to many subsequent accounts, no formal examination or positive identification of the substance was ever made. No portion of it was ever sent to Baltimore or anywhere else. The conclusion that the substance was beef liver was based solely on the examination made by Harold Gay on July 1, 1947. For the next 16 months, George Sauter continued his personal investigation, later hiring another private detective, George Swain. It was apparently Swain who decided that the time was right to make their case, not to a grand jury, but to the public at large. On November 14, 1948, the seed that would grow the case of the Sauter family to legendary status was planted. That day, this article, encompassing a full two-thirds of a page, appeared in the Charleston Gazette. Though often flowery and interspersed with commentary, the article does give a full, detailed account of most of the events leading up to publication. The result was as one would expect. Calls and letters came in. During the first half of 1949, accounts of the Sauter's investigation was in and out of the news. It became apparent that the best way to settle the matter would be to excavate the site where the mortal remains of the Sauter's five children should be resting. At one point, Detective Swain attempted to retain the services of well-known former fire marshal Thomas Brophy. However, the funds needed to retain Brophy could not be raised, and attempts to involve the FBI in the matter were also unsuccessful. Ultimately, George Sauter opted to undertake the excavation and examination on his own dime. He retained the services of Washington pathologist Dr. Oscar B. Hunter and hired some locals and their equipment to excavate the basement area. The laborious task got underway on August 18, 1949. State Fire Marshal C.A. Raper, along with an assistant, drove to the scene early that afternoon. Amidst bits and pieces of inner tubing, roofing, and other non-flammable material, six small bones were found. Dr. Hunter took the bones back to Washington. He ultimately determined that four of the six bones were human and had come from the same person. The four bones were lumbar vertebrae and fit together neatly. However, the bones did not show any signs of having been exposed to a fire, and a subsequent examination determined that they had come from a child of 16 to 17 years of age. Maurice, the eldest of the Sauter children said to have perished in the fire, was only 14. By 1950, authorities had grown concerned over the Sauter's continued intransigence. Their letters and papers reveal that they were generally of the opinion that Jenny and George Sauter were being taken advantage of by unscrupulous and opportunistic charlatans, taking them for as much money as they could while propping up their hopes with fantastical notions. 
From day one, authorities had rested their conclusions on the apparent fact that no one on the night of the fire had seen the five Sauter children exit their home. Mr. and Mrs. Sauter countered with the also apparent fact that no human remains of any significance were ever found. The contradictory nature of the events of December 24th and 25th, 1945 have been reviewed, scrutinized, interpreted, and reinterpreted literally hundreds of times. The panic and confusion of the moment, the passage of time, and the emotionally charged nature of the case have resulted in a myriad of varied and alternate versions of the tragedy. We will now re-examine the events of December 24th and 25th, 1945. In the process, we will highlight and expand upon some of the key points of contention that have arisen over the years. Resetting the scene. It is December 24th, 1945. Eldest daughter, Marion Sauter, has just returned home from work at Wall's Dime Store in Fayetteville. The time is approximately 9.30 p.m. By all accounts, the Sauters were gathered together in the living room of their home, located here. The holiday atmosphere was subdued owing to the absence of Sun Joe. A coal-burning stove was alight in the same room. George and Jenny Sauter have always maintained that they went to bed at approximately 10 p.m. and took three-year-old Sylvia with them. George and Jenny's bedroom was located here, adjacent to the front living room. It should be noted at this point that over the years, various accounts have listed slightly differing times for the various events recounted. The times presented here are those most often associated with the events being described. In an interview with the Beckley Post Herald, John Sauter stated that he and his brother, George Jr., retired to their upstairs bedroom at some point between 11.15 and 11.30 p.m. The boys' bedroom was located on the home's second level, directly above the dining room. The Sauter girls occupied the bedroom directly above the living room. An account published in 1967 states that John and George did not recall if the other children were still awake at this time or not. Other accounts, however, state that when John and George went to bed, Marion and the other five children were still downstairs. Virtually every account, including the initial police report, states that the Sauter's telephone rang right at 12.30 a.m., December 25th. Jenny Sauter was awakened across from the bedroom to the combination den office where the phone was located, approximately here. The caller, later identified as Mrs. Frank Harding, had apparently called the Sauter's home by mistake. After hanging up the phone, Jenny Sauter said she checked the stoves in the kitchen, office, and living room. Only a few coals in the living room stove were still smoldering. Daughter Marion was asleep on the living room sofa, and there was no sign of the other children. Jenny Sauter went back to bed, but in her own words... I went back to bed in, in about half an hour... I heard something thrown on the roof. It sounded like a rock. I thought once that I would wake my husband and then decided not to. I dozed off to sleep. Jenny Sauter consistently maintained that she was next awoken at approximately 1.30 a.m. by smoke. However, Thomas Smith, the motorist who drove past the Sauter home that morning, claimed to have first seen the fire closer to 1 a.m., Jenny Sauter exited her bedroom and crossed the hall to the office. She stated that she saw the fire burning primarily in this general location, the extreme southwest corner of the home. Later accounts by the Sauters indicated that both fuse boxes, the electric meter, and the telephone were located in this same area. In her statement to the police the following morning, Jenny Sauter stated that it was at about this time that, quote, the lights went out, end quote. 
This comment about the lights going out prior to her exiting the home does not appear in any subsequent account. Jenny Sauter left the office and ran back to her bedroom where she roused her husband. She stated that she then ran to the bottom of the steps, located here, and called out for her children. Whether together or separately, Jenny and George Sauter stated that they both exited the home via the kitchen and onto the back porch. An account published in 1967 states that Marion, who had been sleeping in the living room, woke up and ran to her parents' bedroom to retrieve the youngest daughter, Sylvia, at about the same time Jenny Sauter was yelling up the stairway. Marion then ran out the front door of the home, located approximately here. According to George Sauter's first statement, he ran around to the north side of the home where he broke a window that led to the interior stairway, badly cutting his hand in the process. This would have placed George Sauter approximately here. George stated that it was at about this time that he looked for the ladder, which both he and Jenny Sauter later agreed should have been leaning against the house in this general area, but was gone. Having been roused by his mother's yelling, John Sauter said that he got up and woke his brother, George Jr., who had been sleeping in the same bed. It is at this point that the accounts of later statements began to diverge from those given immediately following the fire. In his statement to the state police approximately eight hours later, John Sauter stated, I awakened my brother George, and we went into the other room and shook the other kids, and then we ran down the stairs and was going to try to put the fire out. However, an account published by the West Virginia Fire Marshal's office in 1950 states that John and George merely called for the other children. John is sure that when he called to his brothers and sisters sleeping upstairs, he heard replies from one of the other boys. Both John and George Jr. consistently maintained that they next ran downstairs and that the flames were already beginning to engulf the stairway. Both John and George Jr. were slightly burned. They would have then turned right and exited through the front door. Again, given the obvious terror and confusion, it is virtually impossible to establish just how much time elapsed between these various events. Jenny Sauter stated that when she first saw the fire, it was in this area. She next roused her husband, called up the steps to her children, then ran out the back door before John and George Jr. came downstairs. If the fire was indeed beginning to engulf the stairway by the time John and George Jr. were descending, then the flames had already spread from here to here. John Sauter, in his statement to the state police, stated that the wind was blowing from the direction of the corner of the house where the fire started. If accurate, this would have had the wind blowing from the southeast and would have driven the flames in the general direction of the stairway. John and George Sauter Sr. attempted to start one of the family's trucks, intending to back it up to the front porch and offer the children a means of escape. George, however, was unable to get the truck started. Later that day, he told the state police, I must have choked it too much. I couldn't get it started. The West Virginia State Fire Marshal's office later estimated that it would have taken between 20 and 30 minutes for the entire home to be consumed by flames. At some point during this time period, two men, Jeff Atkins and Lonnie Johnson, owners of the nearby Grass Park Tavern, made their way to the Sauter property and may have succeeded in forever clouding most future accounts of the fire. Upon learning of the fire, both men made their way to the Sauter's home in a taxi. In a signed affidavit dated January 3rd, 1952, Lonnie Johnson stated, The building was too far gone for us to do anything about it. While we were moving some of the stuff out of the way, I got a set of chain blocks in a garage building and brought them up to the road and threw them over an embankment. Lonnie Johnson was later taken into custody. 
He pleaded guilty and paid a $25 fine and was placed on probation. Jeff Atkins enlisted in the Army before he could be apprehended. Curiously, in his 1952 statement, Lonnie Johnson made no mention of having been the one who cut the telephone wires to the Sauter's home, something he had confessed to in 1945. The state fire marshal later stated that Johnson would have needed a ladder or other device to have accomplished this, as the wires were 14 feet off the ground and had been cut two feet from the nearest pole. This point of contention is often referenced by conspiracy theorists. They point out that the authorities confirm the telephone wires had been cut while simultaneously casting doubt on Lonnie Johnson's confession. Just who cut the telephone lines and how they managed the feat has never been determined. Motorist Thomas Smith drove to Fayetteville and reached Fire Chief Morris by phone. Morris later acknowledged having received two calls that morning concerning the fire, one from Thomas and another that preceded it. Just what Chief Morris said during this call has become the subject of fierce debate and the state fire marshal later concluded that no version of the subsequent events cast him in a particularly favorable light. When advised of the fire by Thomas, Morris is said to have replied that he knew about it already, but did not know if the fire department would respond, either because A, the weather was bad, B, it likely was already too late to do any good, or C, He was unable to drive the fire truck and couldn't locate anyone who could. The Fayetteville Volunteer Fire Department arrived at the Sauter's home at approximately 8 a.m., roughly seven hours after the fire was first discovered. And, according to the state fire marshal's later reports, the actions of Fire Chief Morris only became less professional and more confounding. Once the debris had been cooled, the search for human remains began. At around 10 a.m., Morris advised George Sauter that no trace of the other five children could be found. Just what was and wasn't found on December 25, 1945, would also become a point of fierce contention. The first report of the Department of Public Safety makes no mention of the debris at the scene. Only two photos of the scene as it appeared on December 25th are known to exist. They appeared on the front pages of the Beckley Post Herald and the Raleigh Register on December 26th. Scanned from microfilmed copies, the photos are not clear and lack fine detail. They do, however, show bits and pieces of debris on site before being hauled away for scrap. This photo, from the Raleigh Register, even shows what appears to be the southeast corner of the home's stone foundation. The large cavity, which was the home's basement, is discernible, although any contents are obscured by the loss of quality from printing and copying. The Beckley newspapers report that amongst the rubble were fruit jars, a stove, bed springs, and children's toys. Later, the tattered remains of a dictionary, known to have been kept in the closet of the boys' bedroom, was found. In the early 1950s, four separate individuals, Fire Chief Forrest Morris, Prosecuting Attorney Carl Vickers, the Reverend James Frame, and Jenny Sauter's brother, Jimmy Cipriani, all told the state fire marshal that they had seen and even handled small pieces of what they thought were human remains of some kind. Their statements, however, were given six to seven years after the fact. According to George and Jenny Sauter, it was not until July of 1947 that they learned of Fire Chief Morris having found remains of some kind in the debris and then leaving them in a box to be buried when the basement was filled in. Morris later claimed to have carried out this task late on the afternoon of December 25, 1945, and yet it seemed to come as a surprise when word of it surfaced in 1947. 
Was this the first time that word of Morris's actions had come to light? Perhaps not. Mysterious WV has found what appears to be the only contemporary references to remains having been found and buried in 1945. In the State Sentinel of December 26, 1945, the reference is fleeting. Tin roofing and other debris was removed and a part of one body was found. However, the Montgomery Herald, in its edition of January 2, 1946, goes quite a bit further. Aside from a section of the headline which reads, Portions of One Body Found, paragraph 5 goes on to state, No more parts of the bodies were found other than as reported the day following the fire. The small portion of a spinal column, apparently that of the little girl, six, was placed in a container and it in turn placed in the center of the basement into which the others had fallen. While no sources are cited, and the veracity of the report itself cannot be substantiated, what can be stated with absolute certainty is that by January 2nd, 1946, word had somehow reached at least one reporter that remains had been found, put into a container, and subsequently buried in the remains of the Sauter's basement. When asked by the Sauters in 1947 why he had not told them about his alleged discovery in 1945, Fire Chief Morris is said to have replied, I thought I told you, but maybe I didn't. The fire marshal's report of May 1950 states that Morris either cannot or will not offer any explanation for his peculiar handling of the matter. If he in fact found the mass in the debris, the family and authorities should have been notified immediately. And what of the many theories... As far as the state of West Virginia is concerned, there is no mystery to investigate. While the precise origin of the fire cannot be determined with certainty, the fate of the five slaughtered children was made official. All five perished in the fire, either from the heat or suffocation. They later stated that this conclusion was based primarily on two factors that seemed beyond question. One, the last time the five Sauter children were seen alive, they were inside the home. Two, no one witnessed the children exit the Sauter's home after the fire was discovered. However, to their dying days, George and Jenny Sauter continued to maintain that there simply were too many extenuating circumstances to accept the final conclusion and they did not express their opinions baselessly or solely upon intuition. Over the years, three primary theories have formed the basis of the Sauter's contentions. One, the children were kidnapped from the home to be sold on the black market to childless couples. Two, the children were taken from the home and later killed by a former employer of George Sauter's as revenge. Three, the children were kidnapped by a brother or brothers of Jenny Sauter and taken to the area around Tampa, Florida. In each instance, the home was set on fire to cover the crime and did not result from faulty wiring or fuse boxes. To objectively examine each theory in exacting detail would take three separate features, each of them exceeding the length of this one. The general contention of each theory is that the five children were taken from the home before the fire started. Only the underlying motive and subsequent fate of the children are varied. The Sauters have consistently based their opposition to the official version of events on four main points of contention. One, no or very little human remains were found in the debris. Two, the fire could not have burned hot enough to fully cremate five bodies. Three, a ladder was missing and the telephone lines had been cut. Four, the power in the home had not yet gone out when the fire was first discovered. The responses of the authorities to these contentions have generally been as follows. One, the fact that little or no human remains were found has not been contested. 
Two, the house collapsed into the basement and the fire burned and smoldered for seven hours, effectively destroying the remains of the five children. Three, the latter could have been removed at any time and by any buddy, yet the alleged cutting of the telephone lines by Lonnie Johnson has been questioned, even by the state fire marshal's office. Four, the home had two fuse boxes, and the fault need only have occurred in one of them. Again, it would be difficult in any reasonable length of time to objectively examine each contention, response, and variation, and Mysterious W.V. has no wish to engage in opinion or commentary. We will therefore confine as much as possible examination of the Sauter's contentions to historical and established fact. From a historical standpoint, the Sauter's original theory about a black market for children is perhaps the best rooted in fact. In the United States, there was indeed a black market for young children in the years following the Second World War. Couples unable to have children of their own and ineligible to adopt would often turn to illegal means to skirt these roadblocks. Unscrupulous opportunists who saw enormous dollar signs in such a demand were known to resort to what amounted to kidnapping. Names like Bessie Bernard and Georgia Tan would later become infamous dealers in so-called black market babies. Could this have been the fate of the five Sauter children? There were reported sightings of the children after December 25th, though the information did not emerge until after the Charleston Gazette article in 1948. According to the official reports and correspondence, the sightings could not be verified. What of the claim that the children were taken from the home by George Sauter's former employer, Fiorenzo Janitolo, a well-known local businessman who owned and operated a jewelry store in Fayetteville? George Sauter later told authorities that Mr. Janitolo came to his home sometime before the fire and made not-so-veiled threats about burning down his home and killing his children. Janitolo, it was reported, had, through a third party, tried to get the Sauters to take out an undisclosed amount of life insurance on their children. Mr. Janitolo was reportedly angered by this, as well as George Sauter's vocal dislike of Italian dictator Benito Mussolini. He is alleged to have sought his revenge through the fire. The fire marshal's report of 1950 states that Mr. Sauter and Mr. Janitolo parted ways in 1943. However, the census of 1940 indicates that George Sauter was already working on his own account, as shown by the letters OA as opposed to a paid wage or PW. He was listed as a truck driver in the hauling business. Curiously, it is Fiorenzo Janitolo's cousin, Cliente Janitolo, whose initials appear in various places following the fire. Newspaper accounts of the time indicate that he was planning to erect a temporary structure for the Sauters on their property. He is shown to have been on the coroner's jury, which rendered the verdict of accidental death. And his name and signature show him to have been the informant on the death certificate and death register for each of the Sauter children. The third theory put forth is that the five children were taken from the home by or at the direction of Mrs. Sauter's brother, Frank Cipriani, and taken to his home in Cortez, Florida. It was this allegation which prompted the brief involvement of the FBI in the Sauter case. In addition, a private investigator from Tampa and the Sheriff's Departments of both Hillsboro and Manatee County looked into the matter. FBI Special Agent John Woodruff made a check of the birth and school records of the two children living with Frank Cipriani in 1951. He reported that he traced their records back to 1941 and came away convinced that they were the children of Mr. and Mrs. Frank Cipriani 
and had resided continuously in Cortez for at least ten years. If the Sauter children had been in Cortez, Florida, it appears that they were not there as of late 1951, by which time the eldest of the five, Maurice, would have been 20 years of age, and the youngest, Betty, 11 years of age. All three scenarios bring to the surface the two questions which appear to be the trap doors upon which any conclusions must hinge. If the five Sauter children were taken from their home, how were they removed without rousing one of the six persons remaining? Often the missing ladder is pointed to as a means of exit, parroting a scenario similar to that of the Lindbergh kidnapping. However, while not impossible, it must be pointed out that the Sauter children slept in two separate bedrooms, the boys in one and the girls in the other. If the time frame established by John, George Jr., and Jenny Sauter is accurate, then a kidnapper would have had a window of at least one hour, 11.30 p.m. to 12.30 a.m., or perhaps even longer, ample time to remove five persons from a home. Therefore, motive and opportunity can be reasonably assigned, but what of means? Whether by two separate windows or the front door, the kidnappers would have had to elude the detection of at least two other persons on each level. George Jr. and John on the second level, George Sr., Jenny, and three-year-old Sylvia on the first, and, perhaps most significant of all, 17-year-old Marion asleep on the couch in the same room where the five children were last seen. The five children ranged in age from five to fourteen, not yet adults, but certainly no longer infants. Is it possible that they could have been removed from the home while the other six were asleep? And yet this question leads directly to the other hinge. If the children were trapped in the house and died in the fire, is it possible for no trace of them to have been left behind? In short, could a burning home generate enough heat to effectively simulate a crematorium? Here, the conclusions have been far less consistent over the decades. The document most often cited is a letter from the Cincinnati Cremation Company, dated December 1, 1951. It states that a fire burning for two hours at an average temperature of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit would not be enough to completely vaporize a human skeleton. And bear in mind that here we are not speaking of one, but five human skeletons, albeit ones of children. Eyewitness testimony has provided ample proof that the Sauter house was consumed by flames and had collapsed into its basement within 30 minutes. How long did the fire continue to burn? Reverend Frame, who arrived at the home sometime before 8 a.m., stated that when he arrived, the basement was still, quote, a blazing inferno, end quote. Fire Chief Morris, when interviewed in 1950, stated that when he arrived at the scene, he turned the fire hose on what he described as, quote, burning embers, end quote. John Sauter told the West Virginia State Police on the day of the fire that the family had been using the basement as a place to repair the motors of their trucks. George Sauter denied that any inflammable liquids or vehicle tires were kept in the basement. The fire marshal's report stated that it could neither confirm nor refute this, and simply noted that it was reliably reported that two 55-gallon steel drums were found in the debris. The Sauters continued to passionately press their case. However, by early 1952, the renewed investigation appeared to be going round in circles. A memo prepared by Master Sergeant N.C. Rieger of the Criminal Investigation Bureau stated that a meeting held on February 5, 1952, seemed to serve, quote, no useful purpose, end quote. 
Three weeks later, on February 26, 1952, T.C. Simmons, the third private investigator employed by the Sauters, withdrew from the case, stating that George Sauter had brought, quote, some amateur investigators in the case with whom I am unable to work satisfactorily, end quote. The following year, the Sauters had this large billboard placed between their driveway and what was then U.S. Route 21. Offering a reward of $5,000, the billboard bore the words, What was their fate? Kidnapped? Murdered? Or are they still alive? In one form or another, the message, along with photographs of the five Sauter children, would greet southbound travelers along this stretch of road for the next 36 years. Over the next 15 or so years, the story of the Sauters and their children would periodically return to the public light via newspapers, magazines, radio, and even television. In 1957, the Sauters distributed copies of this pamphlet. Highly critical of West Virginia State Fire Marshal Raper, as well as other authorities, it peppers the reader with 25 questions of various length concerning the fire and the subsequent investigation. In 1967, this photo arrived at the Sauter's home in a plain envelope postmarked Central City, Kentucky. On the back were written these enigmatic words. Louis Sauter, I love Brother Frankie, little boys, A90132 or 5. Jenny Sauter felt the man in the small black and white photo bore a strong resemblance to their son, Louis, who was just five days shy of ten years old the day of the fire. George Sauter sent another private investigator to Central City. The man took the Sauter's money and was never heard from again. A visit to Central City by George Sauter himself also proved fruitless. On August 16, 1969, George Sauter Sr. passed away at a hospital in Charleston. Two days later, he was laid to rest at the Highlawn Memorial Park in Oak Hill, West Virginia. Jenny Sauter carried on with the search as best she could, maintaining the now ubiquitous billboard and every now and then recounting the sad tale for a new generation of reporters and curiosity seekers. Jenny Cipriani Sauter passed away on February 15, 1989, at the age of 85, maintaining until the end that her five children had not perished in the fire 44 years previous. Following her death, the property, which had been in the family since 1935, was sold. The Sauter's second home still stands and is today a private residence. The billboard relating the story of the Sauter children and the fire of 1945 was torn down shortly after Jenny Sauter's death. Today, traffic roars by on what is now West Virginia Route 16. These motorists most likely ignorant of the fact that they are passing the site of one of West Virginia's most enduring tales. It is a tale that has utterly refused to fade with the passage of time. Today, the tragic story of the Sauter family has found its way to near legendary status in the true crime communities, and this is far from the first time that the tale has been told here on YouTube. Even though there is, officially, no mystery left to be solved, internet sleuths, authors, and amateur detectives from across the country continue to be drawn in by the depth and emotion of the Sauter's story, a story which is now eliciting questions and theories alike from its fourth generation. Sadly, it seems unlikely that any of the questions still remaining in the minds of theorists will ever be answered to their satisfaction. 
the last of the Sauter children to have survived the fire, then three-year-old Sylvia Sauter, passed away on April 21, 2021. Mysterious WV is indebted to her daughter, Jenny, who graciously made available most of the original documentation shown in this feature. Today, the state of West Virginia stands by its ruling. While the cause of the fire remains undetermined, the five Sauter children all perished on the morning of December 25th, 1945. And until their dying days, the remaining Sauter children stood by their ruling. Maurice, Louis, Martha, Betty, and Jenny survived the fire and were either kidnapped or murdered. Either way, please be respectful in any comments you may leave. After all, their five brothers and sisters were taken from them that morning, either by ethereal or human hands. Thank you.